All right. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. This is Dr. Garayas, uh, Stratford. Oh, I almost said the other place. ECPI University, uh, Bio One One Two Anatomy and Physiology. Sorry, gang, it's a little bit late. I am sleep deprived as usual. This is Chapter Twelve. So um, this will sound familiar because uh, we had the lecture on it, um, but uh, you know um, there are other students requesting, uh, you know, a recording of it, and this is also for prosperity for um, upcoming <coughs> anatomy and physiology one students. So welcome, welcome. Now we talked about uh, sensory, uh, the brain as a control center, and the um, descending fires, which is motor slash efferent. Well, the sensory, we have general senses and specialized senses. So the general sense would be like, think about skin and, and, and think, um, you know, uh, the Messinian and uh, uh, Pacinian and Meisner corpuscles, you know, um, as general senses. Then you have the special ones. Special ones think anything inside your head. So eyes, ears, nose, mouth. So that's vision, hearing, um, olfactory, and gustatory, which is taste. Let me move this down, see if this is in our way. And of course, what do sensory receptors do? Actually, uh, there are other textbooks that call uh, receptors transducers. If you look at the word trans, it means to go across because all that your receptors do is to take um, like energy, like example in um, the example of eyes and they take light energy, transduce it or transform it right, into action potential electricity, which the brain can understand. Now, that's what that specific stimuli is here when they talk about this. And who does the interpretation of the sensory events? That is your brain. Therefore, what I mentioned in class, your eyes don't really see, nor do your ears really hear. It is actually the brain that interprets it. There are five types of uh, sensory receptors, and this looks like a beautiful matching or um, multiple choice uh, question. So we can talk about chemoreceptors. Think what? Olfactory and gustatory, okay? And they respond to chemicals. So you taste something. You're not really tasting something. You're sensing some sort of chemicals in an aqueous environment, aqueous meaning water, right? Or water vapor or something moist and um <clears throat> excuse me and uh it then it takes that chemical and then uh for example your taste buds and then they it transduces it into an action potential that um your cranial nerves pick up and then bring to the brain pain receptors are called nociceptors of course they respond to tissue damage mechanical electrical thermal energy and we're going to talk about uh, thermal energy, meaning either the presence of um, temperature or the absence of it. Thermal receptors, which is uh, uh, related to pain receptors, because if you stick your hand in something that's very cold, it will induce pain. You stick something in your hand in something that's very, very hot, it will then, of course, induce pain. Now, mechanical recept mechanical receptors, I want you to think two main things. Golgi stretch tendons right, that we talked about in the patella reflex, and blood pressure, okay? And remember my story about how, um, you know, if someone does a, a you know, sleeper hold, uh, most likely called a rear naked choke, how it like kind of crunches and crushes and puts pressure on your carotid mechanoreceptors, and then your carotid gland, not gland, but your carotid arteries think that what? There's a massive uh, blood pressure increase. So it's going to respond in a massive decrease in your blood pressure. And then that's when you pass out. Photoreceptors, we mentioned in the eye, uh, they respond to light. So I could give you an example, A, B, C, D, E, which of the following are located in your uh, tongue? And of course, chemoreceptors. Which of the following deals with pain? Nociceptors which the, the uh, following deals with actual uh, uh, measuring changes in temperature, thermoreceptors, which of the following deals with your Golgi tendon and or blood pressure, mechanoreceptors, and last but not least, 
like your retina, what is that an example of? And the retina is in your, the back part or posterior portion of your eye in the neural layer of your eye. And that is a photoreceptor. Now we talked about these terms, sensation, perception, and projection, but the one that I wanted you guys to focus on, not only for the exam, but for understanding, you know, anatomy and physiology of your future patients is that your sensory doesn't interpret anything. It is the brain, okay? And, and we also talked about how different personalities will perceive pain. We also talked about the difference between male and female thresholds of pain. Of course, um, your female patient typically will have a much higher threshold of pain due to the uh, female uh, patient having the ability to deal with childbirth, especially if they have a history of childbirth right um now sensory adaptation what is that that's when um, i'm looking for um some tissues because i got a little cold over the weekend what happened to what tissue paper <coughs> oh well um i had it right here oh well i guess i have to suffer through this sensory adaptation you start, your body is inundated with so many sensory, uh, uh, sensory input from the lights to the, to the feeling of the floor, to the feeling of the back of the chair, to uh, what you're currently tasting in your mouth, whatever, you know, uh, and what you're smelling in the room. So many things, but of course, hopefully you're focused right now on this lecture, on this video. So you will ignore all the other things, right? So the sensory, once you have sensory adapt uh, adaptation, you could, you could see that, oopsies, right? Um, you could see that the, the sensory impulses become less and also the perception becomes less because you're focusing on something else. And I related it to placebo effect. I also related to how we have, um, um, what do you call that? How... Um, if you if you have your patient either focus on their pain or not focus on their pain, how those strategies can actually distract your patient from the pain or dealing with their pain better. And uh, but once there's a stronger stimulus or once you're reminded, um, then you'd wake up. Like for example, I, I mentioned, hey, how does your seat feel right now? Oh, that's a stronger stimulus because now I'm thinking about it. Or what if I made the seat hotter? Or what if um, I farted in the room? And then it would change what? Your olfactory receptors, you'd, uh, uh, you'd then what? Uh, you'd wake up to it. And uh, that's sensory adaptation. And remember our medical terminology, the proper, uh, the proper term for farts is flatulence, also known as flatus. Excuse me one moment. I really need a, um, can, can you get me a tissue paper, Niels? I, I really need a, I, I'm, I'm having a hard time talking. Niels, and, and some water. Mm -hmm. um, so the general senses, you have extra, receptive, interoceptive. Can I have some tissue paper, please? And proprioceptive. Uh, proprioceptive. So extraceptive means things that are associated with the, the outside, touch, pressure, temperature, and pain, things coming from the outside. But you also have feelings coming from the inside, which is visceroceptive senses, right? And those are the senses that are associated with, you know, things that are going on inside. And again, blood pressure and stretch. So uh, those were mechanoreceptors, if you recall. But the mechanoreceptors inside are called interoceptives. And you have the proprioceptive sensors. That's when you're thinking of uh, the Golgi tendon and um, muscle, uh, muscle proprioception and also body proprioception. You know where your muscles are at any given time. And then you also know where your, uh, excuse me, I found my tissues. <laughs> ah! Oh gosh, I feel so much better. Sorry about that, gang. So, but, so proprioceptive senses is when, um, you, your body knows its uh, position sense. So proprioceptive, think position sense. Interoceptive, think visceral inside. 
extraceptive thing, things are coming from the outside, like touch, um, you know, uh, pressure. And what, am, what do they mean by pressure? Like, you know, when you go in an elevator or let's say it's a really, really muggy day outside and you can either, you can actually feel the barometer pressure drop. Um, and of course, temperature and of course, pain uh, sensations that are coming from external sources. Uh, free nerve endings, tactile, uh, lamellated, just misers and piscinian. We already went through that. That's the best ones uh, that I could ask about. And know that misers is the one that are um, closer to your epidermal uh, top, top layers, fine touch and texture, uh, two-point discrimination, which is a neurologic thing. And remember I told you about, uh, I, I said the story about, you know how you can take a little pin and um, distinguish between two different points on your skin. Well, that's light touch. That's your Meisner's. And of course, we don't really poke you with the needle. We just, you know, uh, kind of rest it on your, you know, on the top layers of your skin. But the deep Pacinian sub -Q, tendons, ligaments, right? But it's definitely in the dermis. That's your uh, Pacinian corpuscles for deep touch and deep pressure sense. Okay, another picture. And you can see here, the Meisner's are real close to the top. Free nerve endings are at the very, very top, right? And then uh, your Pacinian here, much lower and much deeper. And then they run all the way through your sub -Q and into your muscular layer. Temperature, we remember, uh, we just stated that thermal receptors can turn into pain receptors or can signal into pain or nociceptors because if something's really, really hot or something's really, really cold, it will uh, produce a sensation of pain. <clears throat> Again, another word for pain receptor, nociceptors. Visceral pain, referred pain, that um, the classic one is um, uh, acute myocardial infarction. It will start with uh, pain grade of eight over 10, meaning on a scale of one to 10, it'll be like an eight, nine, 10, uh, especially if it's a male patient. And um, it starts off in your chest, but it can radiate to your left shoulder and your left jaw. And that's because there's a common nerve pathway associated with your heart that runs up through your arm, through your jaw, uh, through the, that side of your face, right? And it's left arm, left jaw, because your heart is on the left side, uh, unless you are one of our lovely classmates who has dextrocardia. And dextro means right. Sinister means left. Here's the repaired pain. Another example I also had was um, um, rebound tenderness in um appendicitis patients where you know your appendix of course is on the right side but if i press down on the left side and lift up really quick it uh it uh it produces pain in mcburney's point here in the right upper quadrant of your abdomen regulation of pain pathways thalamus think what that has the beginning of, of the signal for pain or the beginning of the interpretation of the signal for pain. Cerebral cortex, of course, judges um, and processes the pain, right? And of course, the... Um, is that amygdala? The limbic system, sorry. The limbic system also um, is with the cerebral cortex regarding uh, producing the emotional and responses to pain uh, or the emotional interpretations of pain. Right, it goes, and you know, if if something's unexpected, it it hurts like you know, uh, perception-wise, much more than if you if you saw the pain coming. Um, know these three things: encephalins, serotonins, and endorphins. Those are the three pain inhibiting substances that are produced by your body because your body loves to prevent uh, you from feeling any discomfort. And we mentioned endorphins, especially in running. Um, maybe I mentioned it like, you know, after you have a good workout or it, they call it the runner's high. If you run long and hard enough, um, you, start, you start feeling the same euphoric feeling that you would, you know, if you've taken drugs. Not that 
anybody in the, on this uh, video uh, knows anything about that, um, uh, current party included. Proprioceptors, we already mentioned mechanoreceptors, the Golgi tendon, right? Uh, your, or your tendon of your skeletal muscles. And here's your Golgi tendon organs. And again, uh, um, reflexes, we're going to talk about uh, a little bit more in detail. And I will, I will actually, I think we did talk about the, the reflexes. And one of the classic uh, Golgi tendon things is, um, you know, we talked about, um, you know, when the little hammer hits your, um, what do you call it, Patender, patella tendon, and that process. Okay, here's a nice little picture of stretch receptors and pre-stretch, and we talked about uh, we talked about that in the previous chapter. Visceral sense makes sense, deep sense. So they're uh, Pacinian, um, excuse me, in nature. Special senses, of course, smell is olfactory, taste is gustatory, hearing and equilibrium go together, and of course, vision. We already mentioned that olfactory receptors require um, uh, two things. First of all, the chemical has to be in an aqueous solution or liquid solution, right? Most likely aqueous. But remember, our tongue also loves uh, fat, which is... Uh, uh, you know, uh, lipid, sense of smell, they go hand in hand. And we already talked about how, like right now, I got a nice little upper respiratory, I got, I got a cold. So I had a wonderful burger uh, that my wife made, but how good did it taste? Not as good as it should have, because I'm, um, hey guys, I'm lecturing. Yeah. Nelson, I'm lecturing, please. Olfactory organs. Now, the same thing, olfactory and gustatory. Uh, olfactory and gustatory require an aqueous solution, right? So um, uh, they go hand in hand and they also have hair cells, okay? Um, now the olfactory organ goes right to the, right through the cribriform plate here in your, let's see if I can make this bigger. No, I can't. Um, uh, and this is like a magnification of the cribriform plate. So this is your uh, nose and your nasal area. And then you have your um, olfactory hair cells here that pick up, you know, the chemicals because it's a chemoreceptor, right? And then, um, then goes right to your brain. And we mentioned uh, the idea of, you know, when people snort medications or snort um, you know, legal medications, how easily it can destroy this and how easily it goes right up to the brain and gets, um, and, and gets, um, you know, uh, does its effects. Uh, olfactory nerves, olfactory bulb, olfactory tract. Remember, all of these things also have a limbic, uh, a limbic system because memory and perception is also related to uh, emotional content. Taste buds, okay. On your taste buds, there's, of course, again, hair cells that have to be in some sort of aqueous environment. And if you take a really good look at your tongue, um, even the histology of each section of your tongue looks a little different. The sweet, sour, salty, and bitter. And the last part is like umami, which is kind of like, they call it the savory, which is kind of like the combo of the four that are above it. So where's the, um, um, the sweet and salty on the tip of your tongue? The sour is on the sides and the bitter is in the most posterior part with the umami being in the middle of your tongue. Now I'm going to jump to ear. You have outer, middle, inner ear. Now, the outer ear, let's just jump right into this uh, picture. Not much. Uh, this we can do without the oracle, also known as your pinna. It's the middle ear, which is this section here, and the inner ear that's very important. So uh, we went over the, the pathway on how sound travels through here, which is the external acoustic meatus. Meatus just means whole. Right, we already saw that hole in the, um, the lateral view of the skull, uh, particularly your temporal bone. 
and sound waves travel through here. They shake or vibrate this tympanic membrane, which then shakes or vibrates these three smallest bones in your body, your malleus, incus, and stapes. And malleus is a Latin for hammer, incus is anvil, and stapes are stirrups. And that's what they kind of look like. Then it rattles or vibrates the oval window, which is right here. And then there is fluid called endolymph that's inside your cochlea. And when that shakes or moves, the hair cells within the endolymph, right, um, then transduce the sound into signals that your cranial nerve eight, your vestibular cochlear nerve can then handle. And then we talked about um, uh, these things, the se semicircular canals. We're going to show a little bit better picture of that. That deals with your balance. And again, that's also cranial nerve eight, which is your vestibular cochlear nerve. So your vestibular cochlear nerve deals with two things, hearing and balance. And right here, this is the eustachian tube which connects um, your middle ear to your throat. And it could be a point source for infection, but its true function is to um, equalize the air pressure between um, you know, your ear and uh, the outside world. Osseous, membranous, labyrinth, nice to know, but uh, the th uh, all the items that I just showed you there regarding ear, uh, is, is better to know, must know. This is your uh, semicircular canals. And remember, you see them, one goes this way, the other one goes this way, the other one goes another way to give um, uh, a tube that's going in three dimensions. And there's fluid in it, just like there's hearing, and they have hair cells as well. So if you tilt your head to the left, the fluid will go to the left side of this system and then it tells your brain, hey, and it tells your brain through your cranial nerve eight, your vestibular cochlear nerve, that, hey, your head's tilted to the left and or, hey, your head's tilted to the right. Again, aiding in equilibrium, aiding in proprioception, knowing where your, you know, where your body position sense is and, uh, and balance, of course. Uh, so cochlear, vestibular cochlear nerve, then it goes through the medulla, midbrain, thalamus, of course. And of course, what's the really cool testable item is the audit auditory complex of your temporal lobe, right? And the auditory complex, just remember, temporal lobe, it's close to my ear, you know? Uh, so that's the auditory complex. And it goes through these three way stations in the mid and hindbrain to get to where we need to go. <clears throat> Static equilibrium, that's when somebody's standing still. Dynamic equilibrium is when you're moving around. You know, when something's dynamic, you know, it's moving around. Here's a closer view of your, of the system here. But again, to remind you, vestibulocochlear nerve. The cochlear part is hearing. The vestibule or uh, semicircular canal area is uh, all about balance. <clears throat> and again, hair cells are in play. There's fluid inside. There's also, I, I, I don't think I mentioned this. Uh, um, there's like, the fluid's kind of more like jelly and there's autoliths, which is there's auto means hearing, lith means stone. So there's, and, and when it moves around, it brushes against the hair cells. The hair cells then send the signal to the cranial nerve eight um, on where's your head at. Where's the position of your skull or your body in general? Now, I, I don't think I mentioned. Oh, excuse me. I'm going to be doing this like every five minutes. <clears throat> now, your eyelids and your eyelashes and your tears. Um, they serve uh, a protective function. The eyelids, eyelash, also the, even the way your skull is shaped is done to protect you against um, like sunlight. It's also to help you protect against a foreign body and dust. And of course, you have your lacrimal apparatus, which is tears. 
and that also uh, has uh, lysozymes in it, which they, not only just physically washes your eye or your cornea, the outer area of your eye, um, it also does what? It, um, uh, <clears throat> what am I? One of my word I'm looking for. It also does. Um, um, what do you call that? Lysozymes, it, uh, physical, and also like immunologic lysozyme. I think that's the word I'm looking for. And of course, your extrinsic eye muscles. That uh, remember your lateral rectus, medial rectus, superior rectus, and your um, uh, oblique muscles of your uh, eye also deal with outer movement. Your eye has, uh, well, eyelids, eh, nice to know, just eyelids. But your eyelids are called your palpebrae. And again, what's the function of your eyelids? What's the function of your eyelashes? They're for protection. Um, your eye itself, here's the front part, which is uh, made out of um, a water-like fluid, and that's your aqueous humor. And the um, posterior part of your eye, that's your vitreous humor. And of course, your lens here, connected to your ciliary, ciliary body. And here's the cornea of your eye. Now, um, again, it works on refraction. So it bends the light. All these substances are of different uh, thicknesses. They're different consistencies, but they're all see-through. You know, light should be able to go through all of them. Um, it's, it's a, if there, uh, and its only function is to make sure that the light goes to the back part of your eye, which is your retina, of course. <clears throat> Lysozyme, antibacterial component of tears, good to know. The lacrimal gland is actually located in the lateral portion of your eyes. And then when you have, when you cry and have tears, that it, it means there's an excessive amount. And that's why you get like the sniffles when you cry too much. This is um, the different muscles of the eye. You don't have to memorize them. Just know that if I say your extrinsic eye muscles, what is that function of those things? Those function is to help move your eye together. Now you have the outer, middle, and inner tunics, fibrous, vascular, and nervous. This is good to know. Outer always has to be the tough one, middle, vascular, and the inner one, nervous. It's the inner one, the nervous layer, all the way in the posterior of your eye. That's the one that um, we're focusing on because that's the retina, and that's the thing that's going to take the um, light waves and and um, then, you know, um, um, you know uh, and con convert it into an action potential, which the brain can then interpret. Here's another view, but you could see here the retina. This is your optic disc or your blind spot. Here's your cranial nerve two, which is your optic nerve. And all the other stuff that we talked about. Okay. Of course, it rests inside the orbit of your eye. Uh, cornea, outer tunic. Cornea is, of course, that transparent window of your eye. Right. Again, function is refraction. Uh, sclera, another protective layer. Um, good to know. Uh, choroid, ciliary body. Right. This is this is the important part because it changes the lens shape so you can focus. Remember my story about how I used to burn ants with a magnifying glass. That's what relates to the uh, ciliary body. The iris is the pigmented portion. And again, pigmented by melanin, same function, UV protection, and also, um, uh, you know, uh, controls the amount of light that coming in and out of your, um, uh, your pupil, which is the opening. <clears throat> uh, nice to know, there's another view. Here's another view. You guys can look at that. Aqueous humor. Uh, and this is uh, um, pupils equal and relative to light. We talked about that. 
posterior cavity, vitreous humor, so it's gel. It is the front part or the anterior chamber of your eye is aqueous humor. Optic disc, blind spot, very important. Fulvia centralis, nice to know, sharp vision, but do know and understand that the retina is the goal and there are photo, photoreceptors on there that will sense light. There are two kinds of photoreceptors, rods and cones. Rods, think evening. Cones, day, visual acuity, and color. Here's a nice little picture of it. How they are in real life. Light sensitive pigments upon light absorption, nice to know. Eh, you know, I, I kind of glossed over this for a reason. Now you have stereoscopic vision. This is the reason why your left and right eye have to be in cahoots because we already talked about the blind spot. Another thing we have to talk about is that when you have both eyes working, it, it produces in your brain the three-dimensional image. Um, if you just had your um, one eye and an eye patch, it, it flattens the image in your brain. Here is a nice little diagram that shows you the eye that has both a sensory and motor connections to it, right? Of course, the sensory part would be for the retina and cranial nerve two. The motor parts would be cranial nerves three, four, and six regarding movement of your extraocular muscles. Um, you know, the lateral rectus, medial rectus, superior rectus, and the oblique, which uh, control the eyeball. And of course, where do they all end up? In the occipital, which is the visual cortex, okay? Age-related hearing loss. So we're wrapping things up. Um, Decrease, 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 decrease. Um, and you don't need to know um, glaucoma or cataracts, but uh, just for your edification, glaucoma is the uh, uh, um, loss, of, loss of vision due to um, uh, excessive increase of interocular pressure. Okay, that's it. Um, I'll try to get a... Uh, a test bank ASAP. And I uh, hope you guys are enjoying your Sunday. Um, uh, I'm probably, not probably, I will give you guys an extra hour to study tomorrow. Uh, um, so the exam will be at 9 a.m. instead of 8. Um, so I'll give you guys some more time to study. Okay, and I'll put this in announcements as soon as it's ready. And um, what do you call that? Uh, just have a good night. Study, study, study. Um, last push for this particular class. And I'll see you guys tomorrow. <laughs>